Ever since I was a little girl, I've been searching for the most efficient way to build muscle because we all know it's a slow and defeating process. I mean, you could do what I've always done, which is just wear smaller and smaller shirts, but that too has its drawbacks. People stare at your Here's what we know so far. Hypertrophy is a direct result of either mechanical tension, metabolic stress, or muscle damage. Another thing we know is that as long as you're taking sets to near failure, you're gonna get the same muscle fiber recruitment, whether using light or heavy weight. That was a dumb idea that took forever to do. Also, the method you use to stimulate the muscle does not matter whether you use free weights or machines and cables. The amount of muscle you're gonna grow is virtually identical. One thing there's not a consensus on is if we should train a muscle always at length. And if the answer is yes, then should we modify the range of motion because parts of that are actually at longer length? It's confusing. Let's get into it. To help shed some light on this, we're going to need to look at some recent case studies. In a 2021 case study, they took a bunch of untrained adults and compared them doing a lying leg curl versus a seated leg curl. After 12 weeks, the seated hamstring curl was the clear winner. It showed significant increases in hypertrophy across all three hamstring muscles. If you look at the total volume of the muscles, the seated hamstring curls caused them to increase by 14.1%. Compare that to the lying leg curls, which was 9.3%, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a one and a half fold increase. Imagine if you just reach down, grab your balls, and one of them was one and a half times bigger. That's that's a problem. If you're wondering why I'm sweating so much, currently it's, it's 103. But when you dig a little deeper, you realize, holy hell, this is a lot more impactful than I thought it was because that was just looking at the percentage change across all three muscles. When you look at the individual muscles, you see that the semi-tendinosis and semi-membro, memor, semi member however the fuck you say it, had smaller but still significant increases. But the real change came from the girthier and larger muscle, the biceps femoris. The percentage change was 14.4 compared to 6.5. That's a 2.2 fold increase. I don't even need the ball example to explain to you why that's such a big deal. If you pulled your pants down and your ball was 2.2 times bigger, you might even have to put it in a little adorable sling. Now this study's not without its limitations. It was done on untrained people. And normally that's a huge negative for me, but this study was so well designed that I think we can still apply it to our own training. Because they didn't just split the population into two and had one group do lying and one do seated and compare the results, they had them dedicate a leg. So one leg would be seated, one would be lying the entire time, that way there was no genetic differences and they would compare the results of the individual. They also randomized which leg was going to be chosen for each exercise, that way somebody's dominant leg wouldn't be factored into the results. And these results are attributed to the fact that the hamstring muscles are more at length during the seated leg curl, which makes sense the more you think about it because when you get done doing a lying leg curl you can just lay there and take a nap when you're done with the seated you want to get out of there as quick as you possibly can so given the option now as fascinating as that was and something i'm definitely going to utilize in my training going forward that had to do with hamstrings nobody really gets excited about hamstrings but we do get excited about triceps. In this particular study, they got a bunch of untrained women. With one of their arms, they had them do a neutral tricep extension on the cable. Now neutral just means that their shoulder was at zero degrees. They also made sure that their elbow was at 90 degrees and then went down to zero. So just a very structured range of motion. With the other arm, they had them do an overhead cable extension where the shoulder was at 180 degrees this time. And again, elbow went from 90 to zero. That didn't feel great. So really the only difference is the shoulder is putting those tricep muscles at length. And you could try this at home. I'm sure you're sitting there watching this while you take a shit. Just put your elbow to your ear and you'll feel the stretch. And I'm sure you can smell it too. So how much of a difference does that make? Actually a lot. The overhead version increased the long head by 28.5% while the neutral version increased it by 19.6%. Again, that's a one and a half fold increase. That's a but it makes sense because the long head crosses the shoulder joint. So again, it's in more of a lengthened position as you can track through the movement. But what doesn't make as much sense is the medial and lateral head increased by 1.4 as well because they don't cross at the shoulder joint. So this shouldn't really stretch them any more or less. But what I think it is, is most people just suck at doing tricep extensions and they usually get their shoulders or their traps involved. So by increasing the angle of their shoulder, it just makes it so the tricep has to do the work. Doesn't matter which head, they all have to work harder and keeps you from screwing it up. So is it that simple? Case closed. Just look for ways to put a muscle at length and contract it. No. 
The outlier is the incline dumbbell curl, because when I tested this with the EMG device, I was able to generate less force and it turned out I was wasting years of my life. Now there could be other reasons why you do it, like passive tension or just having that weight on stretch could cause growth, but I'm not the only one that figured out this is probably not the best exercise for your long head. And in my own anecdotal experience, this is the most growth and peak I've ever seen on my biceps since I stopped doing the incline dumbbell curls and found ways to actively overstretch my short head and contract my my long head, simply meaning I've put my shoulder in external rotation and did weird ass curls. And the long head of the biceps is the only muscle I found where this concept just doesn't seem to work as well. But every single other muscle from calves to lats to triceps is more beneficial to train at length. So do it. Now there's something else I wanted to talk about that's very closely related to this, and it has to do with how you fail in an exercise. You suck at failing. Most people end a set the same way. They grind out that last rep, force it to the very top, slam the weight down, and then sit there and scroll through their phone and heart a bunch of thick women until their next set. The flaw in assuming that your muscle has been taken to complete failure just because you can't go through a full range of motion assumes that the top half of that range of motion is just as critical as the bottom half. It's not. They did a study where again, they took a bunch of women. Why do they mostly get women? I'm just gonna assume these were really manly women, so I feel more confident about the results. They set them up on a preacher curl and with one of their arms, they did the initial range of motion. The other arm, the other half of the range of motion. The results, they had greater increases in cross-sectional area in the distal end, so the end closest to your elbow, from the curls that were strictly in that initial range of motion. I'm almost to the point of belly button sweat. So what does that mean to you? It means that regional hypertrophy, where the muscle grows, is dependent upon the range of motion. And or the initial range of motion is when the muscle is more at length, so there's a greater myosinactin interaction and increased mechanical tension. So instead of trying to just hump up that last rep when you're unable to take it through a full range of motion, just cut the range down. Squeeze out a few three quarter reps, then half reps once you can't do those anymore, and then quarter reps. The idea is you're getting more time under tension and more mechanical tension, and this is how you should fail every single set. Easier said than done on something like hack squats. So what did we learn here today? When possible, train every muscle at length except the long head of your biceps. That leads to inefficient myosinactin coupling. Also, change your definition of failure. The point is not to complete a rep, but to create as much damage throughout that muscle as possible. So do a bunch of shitty half reps at the end of every set. As always, programs are linked below all 30 days, 20 videos, 20 bucks. And I'm working on another one based around progressive overload, but not exactly how you think. You'll see. And good fucking luck.